<clears throat> we're very pleased at AAAS to be doing this with so many other groups. Certainly there's YASA, which is, is the place from whence our, our, our principal speakers come, but also the National Academy of Sciences and the Office of Science and Technology at the Austrian Embassy. Is anyone here from the audience, uh, Austrian Embassy yet? Maybe not. Oh, here they are. Ah, bravo, Philip, you come. That's good. Anyway, thanks so much for your cooperation and helping with, uh, with the things. The, uh, tomorrow is World Water Day, and so this event today is really, <coughs> is really in honor of World Water Day, and we have one of the great experts on water. It is, he is Dr. Pavel Kabat. He is the 10th director of IASA. Now, I'm very involved with IASA these days, and often when I mention it to Americans, nobody knows what that is. Well, it's a marvelous institution located in Vienna, Austria, in a suburb of Vienna called Luxembourg. It was created in 1972, and at that time I was working in the White House Office of Science and Technology. And in truth, IASA was one of the great science diplomatic initiatives of the time. It was to try to find something peaceful that these two arch enemies, the Soviet Union and the United States, could do together. And it took a long time to get created, six years of negotiation. The Austrian government gave the, one, of the, um, one of the emperor's palaces uh, for the occasion, and that is still occupied today. Anyway, it's gone on in that east-west uh, re reconcilia <coughs> reconciliation orientation has changed, and it's more now with 20 countries, many of them developing countries. It has a more of a north-south orientation, and it really works in a way as it did before on the great problems uh, facing humankind. And certainly the future of water and water resources is one of the great issues uh, facing at this time um, and facing all of the world's people. And we have <clears throat> one of the truly great experts in this field to talk about it today. Dr. Kabat was born in Czechoslovakia, educated at Charles University, had two degrees there, one in atmospheric sciences, one in applied mathematics, and then after some time working in Canada, went to Holland, uh, got a third degree in, in, uh, in um, hydrology and water resources uh, and amelioration uh, at from Wageningen University, where he is a professor today. He has, still has a significant group of researchers there in Holland, in addition uh, to running this great international institution of IASA. He has some 200 publications in the field, including eight books. He has traveled the world, lectured in many places, uh, and is a great expert in the water field. And Pavel, we're delighted that you're here today and wonderful that you can speak to us. Thank you so very much. Well, very good afternoon. It's an enormous privilege for me to stand here in this uh, house of science, leading house of science, as far as I'm concerned, around the world. I would like to thank you to AAAS for having me here today. Thank you for all the uh, YASA colleagues, institutions, sponsors in the United States, especially thanking to NSF for uh, their sustained support to YASA over the last many, many years. I am going to talk to you today about water. And uh, as already mentioned, I am professor in Earth System Science. I did mathematics, I did applied mathematics, I did atmospheric sciences. But water really is something which has stolen my heart. I was privileged to be part of uh, many of the scientific uh, community around the world, leading more than 20 international projects on water, funded by European Union, funded by NASA, NOAA. And since 2000, I was also privileged to be part of the other community in water, which is a community discussing the real issues on ground. World Water Fora, the discussion with banks, discussion with the investors. And since 2000, I was serving as a science advisor to the Dutch government on the Global Water Forum. And I went to uh, Kyoto 2003, and I went to 2006 Buenos Aires, and then I went to Istanbul, and I went to Marseille last March. And usually we meet with 20,000 plus people, discuss water. And I get home all the time from these meetings and think on the plane, gosh, what did we do there? How much did we achieve? And frankly, not much. 
And I'm frustrated as a scientist with, with ourselves, with the science community. I'm also frustrated a little bit with uh, the overall governance, uh, either govern governmental or non-governmental of the water issues, because I believe that there is a still a huge amount of work to be done in water sector for the future. And my lecture today will be giving some of the leads how I believe, EASA believes, and with me many of the members of the global community in water, the way ahead could look like. So if you look into any of the publication which you will find in the multiple copies everywhere about water, there is no doubt that uh, the world leaders agree that water is one of the most pressing <coughs> issues for the sustainability of the future. This is one of the examples of the ranking which came for, of many meetings of the world leaders. However, water crisis, the urgency, we agree. Science agrees with policy and with uh, private sector. When it comes to the uh, decisions, what to do, we simply have noses pointing to different directions still. And we do have a very different perception of the risk and urgency when it comes, for example, to floods. This is the um, uh, most recent cast on the world water use around the world in thousands of cubic kilometers per year. And it's uh, broken down into the sectors. So agriculture blue and light blue households, reservoirs, industry, the pink one. And I think there are two or three very striking things on this, on this, on this, on this figure. First, the number, total number of uh, uh, cubic kilometers of water we are using every year, which is almost 6,000. Every year, the humanity on this planet needs 6,000 cubic kilometer water to exist. The other striking feature there is that the enormous gradient of the increase in water use around the world. In 1900, we were using roughly 500 cubic kilometers around the world. Now it's 6,000. But to me, the most striking uh, on this is the dark blue line, because that shows that agriculture, the food production, is currently accounting for about 70% of the global water use. So out of the 6,000 cubic kilometer, close to 4,000 goes to the agriculture. And I think this is uh, one of the um, big points I'm going to make today, which leads obviously to so-called water and food nexus, which is one of the uh, big discussion points today. Similar numbers are now broken down by continent. You see here uh, uh, a quite a consistent, coherent set of um, graphs covering North America, uh, Europe, for example, which is uh, showing a sharp increase of the water use between 40s after the World War, Second War, and until 80s, and then a leveling off due to the different measures, which of course are also accountable to the international and national policies. However, the most striking here is the green line, which is showing Asia. Asia is a complete continent. Sharp increase, which is going on, and actually showing that Asia is accounting already now for almost 70% of the water use globally. Now, if you combine these two numbers, these two informations, one, the most of the water goes to agriculture. Second, the real user is Asia, so you have a first hotspot of the future water, future water concern. And we used to talk about Africa, we still do. In our analysis, in our position, Asia is going to be the hotspot for water-related issues for the coming decade. Of course, these pictures, there are multiple. Uh, we know from the latest analysis, for example, from the IPCC, but also from uh, other assessments that we still have, despite of the uh, MDG agenda, close to 1.4 billion people living in the watersheds, which are basically underrepresented when it comes to the uh, cubic meter water unit per capita per year, even worse situation with the sanitation. We also know that um, we are going to develop. There are scenarios, of course, for next 30 years where, the, for example, global population goes. I'm coming from IASA, and uh, we have a very strong uh, population dynamics groups, which came up with the uh, numbers uh, about two more billion people by 2050, which, by the way, is much less 
than we were expecting five years ago because the uh, demographic models got refined by including new parameters like uh, education level of the women, which led immediately to a much lower projections of the expected numbers. So two more billion people in 2050, at least one billion, maybe 1.5, will be added in Asia again. So the number three parameter, voting for Asia as a major hotspot. Um, of course, water is uh, an agent which is serving other sectors. So uh, there is an increased amount on electricity, for example, which will need water too. And last but not least, thing which we talk about and write about, but do not really take seriously, ecosystems. I haven't seen so far any serious study which will actually, went, which will go as far as policy and conclusions taking environmental flows as a user, as a player, which will be able to stand up against, for example, agriculture. It's still very difficult. Yet we know that ecosystems, environment, would need water. Water which will be not touchable by other users. We need a policies, we need a system, governance, to agree how to do that. Let me now spend a couple of minutes uh, to talk about something which I call the very well hidden water issues, water issue for the future. This is a beautiful picture of the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh, which of course is a low country, partly below sea level, and it's really delta of three main rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna. Delta means that all the water should be coming down. And of course, this is not always the case because there is a lot of activity upstream, those rivers, a lot of dam building, for example, in China, in India, etc. So there is already a development which took place over the last 20 years where the discharge down to the delta is becoming lower and lower. Now, what we did in one of the projects uh, supported by Asian Development Bank, we look into the salinity intrusion from the coast uh, inland and uh, we use the so-called 5 PPT line, which is a water too much too saline to drink, to cook, but even to wash because you will get rush, skin rush and all these problems. Now, what you see here is a small animation. The current situation, without any sea level rise, look at the city of Kulna, which, is, which was the project I was involved in. The city of Kulna is about 100 kilometers from the coast. And there is a, during this dry season, there is a saline water as much as the city of Kulna, which is one million people now, cannot use it. So there are already, we call them salinity refugee, leaving the city of Kulna to the other places. We talk about uh, 80 million people now, which do suffer from the too saline water at current. And look what happens when we play with the sea level rise. If sea level rise would follow the IPCC projection in 100 years time, this is where the 5 PPT salinity would go. In, in, uh, involving yet another 100 million people in the problem. Now, this is not only issue of the sea level rise. This is also issue of how much fresh water we will get from the upstream countries, because the way to get rid of salt is, of course, to flesh it out by fresh water. And this is issue which is transboundary issue. As we speak, there are countries talking about building new dams. This is the case of Bayo Bengal. If I go to similar region, the salinity problem, which is the uh, Mekong Delta, for example, Laos, which is upstream country to Vietnam, is going to build more than 20 dams within the next 20 years. So we have a problem encroaching from two sides, which is the cut of the discharge of fresh water from the upstream countries down to actually fresh out the salinity, uh, which is in the Delta, and then the intrusion from the sea level rise. I haven't seen any study so far, any study at all, which would sort of calculate how big this problem is. Is it one billion people in 2050, 2030, having too much saline water? What is the solution to it? There is no solution but transboundary, which means to have some agreements about leaving some of this fresh water which needs to be used to fresh it out. But there's also solution technology. Let me give you an example how we are setting up dialogue in this new project I will be talking about in a minute. For example, with the private sector and technologies. Salinity, of course, has been solved a long time ago. We have uh, companies around the world which can desaline water by so-called reverse osmosis system, and it's actually being done. It's being done in Sydney, it's being done in Egypt, it's being done uh, in the major centra around the world for recreation. The problem is it is that it produces water, one cubic meter fresh water, for about $1.50. Now, that's okay for you and me when I go there for holiday, 
that's far from being okay for 1 billion peasants in Bangladesh or in Vietnam to use it for irrigation. So we are challenging in our water future scenario project those companies tell us, look, if you give us a plausible technology transition pass where your technology would become 10 times cheaper by 2030, I will calculate for you the real global market because then you have 1 billion customers rather than 100,000 coming to the recreation regions around the world. This is the type of the PP, public private academia discussion we are trying to introduce when it comes to the future water solutions. Groundwater, yet another issue. It was a big issue about 15, 20 years ago, but again, we lost somehow interest in point pointing the groundwater issues uh, to the right direction. This is a uh, most comprehensive data set which was put together ever, showing which fraction of the uh, water supply, water withdrawals, is coming from groundwater. You see the scale between zero and dark blue is 100%. You see there are regions around the world, like for example, again, Indian continent, where we depend up to 80, 90% for, for water supply on the groundwater. And there are regions where it is about 50%. Now, we do assume somehow, without thinking about it very much, that this will stay like that. By 2050, when there is a one more billion people in India, we still will be, in, according to our expectations, able to withdraw 70% of water from groundwater. Well, is it the case? Look at the evolutions around the world. Look here at the United States. Look at Europe. Look at the regulations. Probably not. So we need to look into the feasibility of assumption that the groundwater resources will stay as they are in the regions where they need them. We have played with it a little bit in a recent paper in Science where we sort of cut the groundwater availability by 20% for uh, some of the regions around the world. Uh, you see the pictures becoming very, very bleak because we will miss a large part of the water balance in our water supply. You see the similar uh, picture showing which part of the water supply for irrigation comes from the groundwater. This is showing for the domestic, and this is showing for the others, just to show you that we have the data. Now let's go back now to the basics, science. Is really the hydrological cycle changing? Is it changing and why is it changing? Why do we talk about uh, big uh, changes in the water cycle? Well, a very simple way, the water cycle has four components. Pre precipitation, rainfall, evaporation, the return of water back to the atmosphere, runoff, meaning water running off back to the, oh, to the sea in the ideal case, and storage. So I'm going to lead you quickly through uh, those four elements to show you why we believe that this water cycle is changing. First is precipitation. And I'm going to do no magic, no models, just data, just measurements. This is showing the 105 years of land precipitation from 1900 to 2005, measured uh, by the combined uh, gauges and satellite-based uh, rain monitoring network. And uh, we could roughly see two trends there over the last 105 years. There is a part of the world, a lot of parts of the world, where precipitation actually increased over 100 years, as there, is a, there are parts of the world where it decreased substantially, uh, mainly when it comes to the evolution uh, after the 1950s of last century. Now, if you would study those uh, graphs a little bit more and try to collocate those with the regions which hit the newspapers last 15 years about big drought or big flood, you would understand. It's very consistent with the measurements of precipitation. Runoff. Why would runoff change? Why would it change because of the evolution of the last 50 years? This is a compilation, Munich Reed, this Viseasa did, putting together the world cities bigger than 5 million inhabitants in 1950. We had New York, we had Sao Paulo, we had the uh, West European conglomeration, London, Paris, Randstad in Amsterdam, Moscow, and Shanghai and Tokyo. This is 1950. This is now. Now, why I'm showing this? This enormous growth of the uh, coastal cities, urbanization, means that we are fastening the runoff. We are building hard surfaces around the world. And we are leading water much faster back to the sea. We don't give it any more time to infiltrate to be part of the water cycle. So when I put it in the simple graph of the hydrologist, this is what's happening. The precipitation is uh, the red one. And this is how the precipitation is normally led through the landscape in the runoff, very gentle curve, and this is what happens in the urbanized area. 
This is the reason why we have so much discussion about coastal city flooding over the last 50 years, urbanization. So yes, runoff is changing a lot due to the human intervention. Of course, I can also talk about deforestation, but this is the classical example of changes. Of course, this has all the consequences which, is, which are water related. We have done a uh, vulnerability projection for the major mega cities around the world, from Tokyo all the way down to Jakarta. We look into the population estimates now and five years time. We look into the change. We look into the GDP now, GDP 2015, and what is the potential loss of GDP due to this risk of flooding. You see here that there are regions around the world, like for example Jakarta, where the GDP loss compared to the current loss in within the next five years may increase as much as by 90%. Storage. Why would storage change? I made for you a nice animation which is showing how many dams we have built since 1850. Go with me. In 1850, the world was natural rivers. This is what we have now. These are just dams bigger than 500 cubic kilometers. 500,000 cubic meters. Now, without any deep hydrology or mathematics, you would agree with me that there is no more natural runoff to the sea. It's all modulated runoff. We are changing heavily the discharge regimes of the major rivers. The global water cycle depends on us now, much more than on the rainfall, as a matter of fact, if you look into this, uh, this population of the dams. Climate. Water and climate, of course, is a big issue. And I'm not going to give you a big lecture about you know, how well we are doing the uh, climate scenarios and how much I believe that they are good enough for investment in the water sector. I'm just going to give you one, one example where I think we should stop discussing climate issue, not climate issue. This example goes back to numbers again. I call it the sheer size of the problem, which we sometimes forget. Currently, we are emitting every year about 7, 7.5 gigaton of carbon. Numbers are old, but it's about a number. Um, there is a lot of carbon in the atmosphere already, almost 800 gigaton. There is a lot of carbon in the standing biomass, even more in the soils. And we have measured, I mean measured, and I just visited today the National Academies, and I saw that a nice killing curve, which is actually good data, said we have actually replaced from the reservoirs in the soil and in the um, fossil fuels, about 200 gigatons to the atmosphere. Now, we repeat these numbers. My students do it, and I think everybody in the room will be able to say these gigaton emissions. But if we sit down and think, lay back and think, what is it actually? What is one gigaton of carbon? Well, we did some calculation with my Wageningen students. One gigaton is more than the mass of all humans on the planet. It's more than the annual global production of iron steel around the world. But we are close to New York. It's uh, 2,740 Empire State Buildings. And I like, I like most the last one. One gigaton is 142 million, 857, 142 African elephants in weight. No morals. No magic. This is what we are doing to the Earth system. This is the carbon balance. And I think that uh, being water manager, being water cycle scientist, whatever we think about uncertainty, we are obliged to ourselves to investigate consequences of this major movement in the air system by the human intervention. So, what is the take of my lecture? What is the way to line up our actions ahead? What is the way, in my view, to look into the real progress? Can we make a real progress? In our reading, Yasa reading, the progress could be made through much better transsectoral and transdisciplinary thinking in water. And I will give you some examples of what I mean by that. Number one, I have been lead author on IPCC since IPCC 2. Usually lead author on the freshwater chapter and CLA on one of those, and currently I am review editor on the water chapter again. And this is the IPCC 4, which uh, we produced about four years ago. And we drafted this, uh, this, this, this amber diagram, changing amber diagram. We did it over a couple of nights, as usually happens in these IPCC sessions. And it talks about uh, vulnerability of different sectors to warming. You see here different sectors, water security and coastal communi communities and energy security and all of that. And at the moment we published that, I thought, well, we did it wrong. Because how can you talk about food security, 
how to put about energy security and water separately. What we really had to do, should have done, was this. To take water out of the vertical line and to make it a cross-cutting, to make water a cross-cutting subject scientifically, politically, governance-wise in these sectors. Nexus idea. And again, scientists which did this IPCC report didn't realize it. We still have been thinking four years ago that you could approach water, water cycle without really being uh, too much worried about the related uh, connected uh, sectors. So take water as a cross-cutting issue in the approaches rather than a sector. And we have done some of the studies uh, just a couple of years ago. This is, this is the one coming, uh, which came out last, last summer in Nature Climate Change, when we look into the water energy environment, health nexus. We look into the availability of cooling water for a large part of the US uh, nuclear and thermal stations and European stations. And we saw the conflict between the warming, uh, too warm water for energy cooling and availability for, for example, uh, irrigation. Up to 20% of the US-based, uh, Western US-based uh, nuclear thermal stations will be underperforming up to 20% during the rice summers because of the cooling water, cooling water issues. We looked into the uh, study uh, at the major three basins around the world, Mekong Delta, Columbia River, and Rhine in Europe. We used all the climate models available around the world to produce the change in discharge. You see here these changes. Don't try to read all the lines. There is a change in seasonality, uh, both um, to dry end and to wet end. What really I'm going to show you is uh, how this nexus uh, work. When you, when, you, when you look at three different uh, parameters. In Columbia River, we look into the uh, environmental flows uh, connected to the salmon spawning. And what you see here. Uh, of course, it's temperature dependent. And what you see here are uh, three lines, uh, the blue one, red one, and the green one. And you see here the 21 degrees C threshold, which you cannot go above if you, if you want to have a healthy environment for salmon. And you see here that for the future scenarios, for about three months, this threshold will be exceeded. So the water environment nexus. In Rhine, we look into the cooling issue. Uh, the European EPA, so to speak, has a threshold of 23 degree of cooling water limit. Above that water, you cannot lose water from the, from the cooling. You see here that for the uh, future world, we would have a extended periods between March and September of not being able to cool our stations, meaning leading to the, we we'll call it, code threat in the European system of not having enough resources from the thermal stations. In Mekong, we look into the WHO, stan sorry, WHO standard of uh, healthy water, which is 25 degrees C. And we did simulations with the best models we have, how they would look like in 30, 40 years time. And you see that from about uh, February until October, this standard will be, will be exceeded. Water, environment, energy, health nexus. And I don't talk here even about the irrigation water. Of course, this all, this all will be threatened by the primary user, which is irrigation. That water will go out simply for irrigation. Another example, water, climate, poverty, economy nexus, if you like. It's connected to the um, variability of rainfall in uh, many of the countries which are subject to the development goals. This is Kenya, showing the huge interannual variability from years to years. Years with a lot of rainfall, years with a very little rainfall. The study which uh, were done to look into the way how uh, the uh, global, the uh, domestic, gross domestic productivity product, economic product, depends on such a variation, show a strong correlation between the GDP growth, which is this one, and variability of rainfall on it. When you uh, study this, and when you look at it from the hydrologist perspective, of course, the way to deal with the variability is uh, to build storage. Not only big dams, which could be controversial, very controversial, water harvesting, groundwater storage, what have you. And if you compare the uh, developed water infrastructure countries around the world, how much water storage is there by the artificial measures, United States, North America, Europe, we talk about five up to 6,000 cubic meter per capita. If you go to the countries which we are investing in through the development goals, through the uh, major injections by the major sponsors and donors, water storage is much, much lower. 
artificial water storage. Ethiopia, for example, only 40 cubic meter. So no doubt there is an issue when it comes to the interannual variability of rainfall. A lot of droughts, a lot of floods. We have done an exploratory study in which we looked in a, a possible solution. We took countries from the um, sub-Saharan Africa, from Lesotho all the way down to Morocco, uh, Morocco actually is above Africa, above Sahara. We look into the current uh, situation there. We set the standard at a level of 800 cubic meter per capita, which is not the European, but which is the standard from South Africa, which has a reasonably well-developed infrastructure. We calculated the gap, how many cubic meters should be built to come to the South African standard. And we calculated investments, and we calculated and a scenario in which those countries will be growing at a rate of 5% a year, and all that grows will go to the infrastructure and water. And the result is stunning, because we calculated that, for example, for a country like Uganda, it will take 58 years of investment of the sustained growth to get to the infrastructure compared with South Africa. These are numbers which are indicative, of course, but I think it shows the sheer size of the issue when we have to reconsider, reconsider the position of the water infrastructure in those, in those places and the way how we deal with it in the investment modes. Water management. I mean, there are books and books written about how to manage water. IWRM concept and many of these which we discussed for the last 15, 20 years. When it comes to climate, we have a problem. When it comes to future, we have a problem too. This is a um, very bad print of the book, very bad page. If you go to Georgetown, by the way, I haven't found any any bookstore anywhere in Georgetown, which I was very disappointed last night. There were many, but uh, they are gone. Anyway, they are gone, right? Anyway, I wouldn't buy such a book, right? Neither you would. Unless I would know there is a treasure in it. So I would buy it and bring it to graphologist, and then after some time and some money paid to him or to her, he will get me back this. A couple of words which will be readable. So we see summer and temperature and shade and, and again summer and et cetera, rough winds. So what do you think the book is about? Must be climate, right, Norm? Actually, it's one of the beautiful tales of Shakespeare. I'm putting it here to illustrate how big misunderstanding, how big gap is there between water managers, on one hand, on the other hand, those who are putting together scenarios, future solutions, and climate. I strongly believe there is an artificial barrier which can be bridged over very effectively by a dialogue which scientific community, which I present here, should embark again at, on. Now let me show you what I mean by this. Suppose you are an engineer, and some of you are water engineers, and you are charged with a, with a task to build a dam somewhere in the world. What you will do? You will collect data, last 50 years of data, rainfall or discharge, and you will make a very basic Gaussian distribution right, of it. So this is the 50 years of rainfall. Then you will say, okay, what do I, what do I want to do? I want to have an adaptation with the variability of discharge, both on the dry end here and the wet end here. And I will build a dam, which I can calculate, which span this, this range of my discharges, which will be big enough to discharge water for the dry time and big enough to protect me from the flood. And when I build this dam, I also know and knew that there is always tales in this which are extreme risk tales. I mean, once in a while, this dam cannot cope with it anymore, so I have a drought, and once in a while, I have a flood. Now, this is dealing with uncertainties. I am telling to my friends, engineers, on water, we have been always dealing with uncertainty. We never constructed a deterministic dam. So when we accept this uncertainty based on the data, why not to do the same with the future scenarios? Because this is the future climate, for example. It shifts a little bit. So when I draw it, overlaying the original data, I see here that suddenly the uh, region which I was used to have once in a while drought is becoming bigger, more frequent. This is a school example, school cartoon, what we mean by increased drought frequency. And now we, we, we go astray when it comes to climate. We should not because what I am offering here as a hypothesis, try to solve it in a system way, in combined way, cross-sectoral way. So for example, in this uncertainty range, 
here, which I can calculate integrating these curves in the money, if you like, or in whatever. I could do a little bit of increase of the dam capacity, a little bit of the insurance, a little bit of the microfinancing, a little bit of the land use change. And I'm doing this in an iterative way with the users and with the investors. So my next message is here today, the uncertainty in communication between water management and on other hand, scientists on the other hand providing data is artificial one. We could build such a partnership, managing the risk in an iterative way by actually having science dialoguing with the sector. So, how, what are you going to do at YASA and together with the global partners to try, to try this? We have launched a new initiative uh, together with the United Nations UNESCO, with the World Water Council, with the uh, International Water Association, which is the association unifying the major water technologies and business utilities, and the Korean government, because Korea is hosting the next Water Forum in 2015, to launch so-called Water Futures and Solutions Initiative. An effort which would try to use some of these new concepts and principles to create a global and regional and sub-regional uh, information about how the water futures may look like, both in the problem sense and in the solution sense. Now, of course, there is a lot of science behind, there is a lot of comments behind uh, what, is, what, is, what is really missing in the existing global scenarios. For example, more social science is needed. And this is exactly what this particular project will try to improve. However, the most important uh, new thing in this project will be that we will try to set up the project from very beginning involving the users, involving the investors, involving the private sector in definition phase of the project. To make them so-called culprits of the whole exercise. Not to produce assessment, which we have done many, many, many times in the past, and after five years to put it on the desk and say this is it and you follow it. So we are combining the water businesses, the social, economic, ecologic, and uh, other impact community with the physical water, water, water people in a joint teams to produce a plausible scenarios of uh, future water uh, availability, water governance, and water solutions. I'm not going to uh, bother you much with all the details, just quickly to scan this. It will have all these scenarios, uh, for example, population growth, uh, the economic GDP projections connected to that. It will be fully consistent with uh, the IPCC 5 socioeconomic passes, with the IPCC 5 climate scenarios, and what have you. The project itself has started by a launch meeting in YASA uh, two months ago. Uh, some of you attended the meeting, a meeting about 80 people attended by um, academia, uh, governments, uh, banks involved in water, ADB, World Bank, Korean government and others. The project itself is um, focused on uh, deliverables to come in two phases. One, uh, by the time of the Korean Water Forum 2015, to produce a first set of the global scenarios and solutions and the focus set on the South and Southeast Asia. And the second one by 2018, 17, 18, the full global picture. The project is started by its kind of organizations uh, scheme. This is a uh, layout of how it looks like. Governing board, the uh, scenario groups, the project uh, group, and uh, the experts which are called upon when it comes to special issues. This is what it will produce and much more. And uh, my uh, introduction of this project here is also at the same time call on you to join us in this effort because it's uh, comprehensive, global, and it needs also your involvement and your help in many ways. I am going to um, finalize with two cartoons. One is showing how I think about water and about climate, as a matter of fact. The left part of the cartoon is putting environmental resources threat, other threat, in the corner of the problem. And it sort of determines the attitude to a solution. If you have a problem, you go after it and you are kind of cramped already because you have a problem. I think that environmental issues like water resource issues, like energy, like climate, should really become our partner. We should change completely our mindset to see this as a possibility to innovate. So uh, changing the attitude from putting water as a water crisis as a threat into major opportunity 
is one of the hypotheses I would like to make here for discussion. The other one is need for a vision. This is Seneca. And if you look around to the major businesses, Shell, BP, but also other big investors, they do put their money, big money, on the projects, and they have a vision. They have a, they have a outlook. They have a foresight. They try to understand what happened to my investment in 20, 15, 30 years' time. What the sector doesn't do it. And I think this is what we need to change. We need to be able to put up a plausible set of futures in which we would like to see our water infrastructure, and we actually have to be able to guide our investments within that envelope of the public futures. Of course, this is a plea for the Water Futures Initiative, but I think it's badly, badly needed. And the last one is, thank you again, and I hope that many of you will uh, join us at YASA soon. This is one of these uh, features of YASA given us graciously by Austrian government, uh, where we are hosted, and I hope I will be able to welcome you there soon. Thank you very much. We know, will the panelists please take their places on the stage? And let me introduce the coordinator for the panel discussion. And of course, you will be, or you will be seated with the panel too. There are indeed enough chairs. Um, the coordinator for the panel discussion will be Dr. Aaron Salzberg. And he has the title of Special Coordinator uh, for Water Resources at the Department of State here in Washington. I'm very pleased to see Aaron. I haven't seen him for some time, but we formerly were colleagues when I also was working in the State Department. So, Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. And uh, th thank you, Norm. He's, he's very kind. There are few people that spend as much time and effort as Norm does to developing the next generation of science diplomats. And it's been my great pleasure to have the experience to have worked with him a couple of years ago. And anybody who gets a chance to work with him, I'm sure you share that. Um, we're very fortunate to have a, a great group of panelists to respond to some of what you heard, but we're also going to turn it open to you and uh, get your thoughts and questions. Uh, just so that there isn't any doubt where we stand, uh, we certainly share the sense of urgency that AISA has for these issues, and we're very excited about the effort uh, that Pavel has outlined. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, the report from the Global Intelligence Community, the, the U.S. Intelligence Community, that came out about a year ago on global water security. And uh, for, for those of you who haven't, and this was requested by former Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, the report found that many countries that, that we care about and are very important to the United States are going to experience water problems, shortages, uh, poor water quality, floods, many of the things that Pavel just talked about, that in addition to the humanitarian impacts will impact their ability to work on priorities that we think are important, will impact their stability and security, and will impact the security and stability of regions that, that, that are important to us from a US foreign policy perspective. So this is a very important problem for all of us. Um, again, very fortunate to have a great group of panelists here. Um, we'll ask them for a couple of thoughts, but perhaps me just to introduce them as we go down the line. Uh, Dr. Bill Young, maybe you can wave for a quick second, uh, is the director of Water for a Healthy Country, but I guess to put it more simply, is the director of water research at the, Austra at the Australian National Science Agency. And uh, next to um, uh, Bill is a good friend of mine, Julia Bucknell. Julia Bucknell manages the uh, World Bank's uh, Central Water Unit. Her job is really managing uh, the knowledge portfolio and almost $300 billion worth of, of lending and tens of millions of dollars in knowledge work spanning the entire water sector. And uh, I think she's loath to admit it, of course. Um, but she has worked for the World Bank for quite some time and in Just almost all the six geographic regions on the, uh, in the world and, of course, a, a great member of the water community internationally. Uh, Chuck Chetavis, down at the far end, is a principal at the Global Environment Technology Foundation and I think it's fair to say the acting executive director for the U.S. Water Partnership. Yeah, is that a fair... Uh, maybe, maybe a fair, at least, at least in principle, a fair statement. Um, maybe I'll turn it to you, and then I'll go back out to the audience really quickly. But uh, first, maybe do you share Pavel's sense of urgency on these issues? 
Uh, do you share his frustration with what we in the water community have been able to do in terms of making the case and making some of these linkages that, that I think Pavlo has pointed out? And where do you think the scientific community can play a role in both identifying some of the key opportunities but identifying some of the key questions that we actually need to answer if we're going to make this the issue uh, that, that we all believe it is? And maybe, Bill, maybe I'll start with you quickly for maybe sure. five minutes or so. Yeah, thank you. Um, absolutely share the, the same sense of urgency, maybe not quite the same sense of frustration. Um, much of the picture that Pavel presented in terms of the global challenge, I use a very similar set of information in presenting uh, that global challenge back in Australia and then come down a level to look at the similarities and dissimilarities of the Australian situation. And Australia has many of those uh, similarities with a warming and in many parts a drying climate. Uh, already highly urbanised but still increasing in terms of uh, urbanize, the level of urbanisation and an increasing population over coming decades. Around 90% of our water use is uh, taken up with uh, irrigation. Um, and while we have a re relatively high on the global scale uh, per capita water availability, that's because we have a very small population. Um, and we have a very large irrigation uh, sector, uh, which is focused particularly in drier parts of the country. So we use um, around two thirds of the water used in irrigation comes from the Murray-Darling Basin, which only has about 6% of the water resource of the entire nation. And that's been an area where over the last few decades, uh, there has been evidence of a drying climate. We've just experienced the worst drought on this historical uh, record uh, at over a, a decade long. And we've been experiencing a long period of over allocation and high levels of environmental stress. So uh, absolutely share this, the same sorts of urgency. Now, I guess in Australia, we've had the last decade of trying to deal with those problems and undertaking um, significant efforts in uh, science and research to inform that policy uh, and planning process with some success, I might say. So the frustration level is perhaps different when we look nationally and regionally. Um, the, the success of that, I, I guess, for uh, our teams in Australia is saying, we think we have made some progress both in water reform in the institutions and in our legal frameworks um, and many of our market and regulatory mechanisms as well as the science and information bases that underpin that. And we're looking at how we engage more globally, particularly into our region, to uh, help other parts of the world learn from some of the things we've been doing. And that's why we're particularly excited to be uh, joining with IASA in some of the global work to bring some of, uh, engage our, some of our expertise with expertise from uh, elsewhere around the world. We're also beginning to work in quite close partnership with the Australian Aid Agency and the work it's doing in, particularly in South Asia, um, where some of the, the, the globe's water issues are in starkest uh, focus, if you like, uh, with both population, climate change, the urbanisation challenges, uh, and a whole raft of water quality issues that relate to human health as well. There's an overlay. Um, so I, I guess just a couple of points on some of the, the reforms in Australia, uh, because they pick up on a couple of comments Pavel uh, made. Um, we, we have gone through this process of a significant effort in um, science and research to provide the evidence base to guide policy reform. Uh, and that's with some success. Um, I actually spent a year taking some of our modelling systems, working inside our government agencies, building the <coughs> modelling teams to build the scenario uh, platform to guide the preparation of uh, new planning uh, uh, arrangements for the Murray-Darling. That There is now a new basin plan, which is in fact passed into law at the national level in the, the Murray-Darling. And over the next... Um, I guess four or five years, the arrangements in that will see irrigation water use reduced by about 20 to 25 per cent uh, to address over allocation. And that was getting to that point was driven by uh, a partial and imperfect knowledge base of environmental water demands and needs and building those into our system models to demonstrate how we would better share our scarce and sh shrinking water resources. Um, to m m meet those multiple outcomes of environmental outcomes and consumptive economic as well as social uh, outcomes given uh, significant communities that are, are built around the irrigation systems. Uh, so th that is, um, uh, we have now I think two, in our terms, 2,000 gigalitres or thereabouts, a bit more, which is about 2,000 uh, million cubic metres of uh, legally protected environmental water that will be actively managed to uh, deliver better environmental outcomes. And that is uh, an owned asset on part of our national government. 
Uh, they are probably the biggest uh, owner of water in the Murray-Darling now uh, as a single owner. They own a large portfolio of water uh, and that has been not uh, recovered by force uh, but uh, purchased on a, an open and equitable water market. Um, uh, so the total ref cost of this reform has been about $10 billion um, and uh, I think about 40% um, of that, about $4 billion worth of uh, purchasing water uh, uh, entitlements, licences on the open market. Uh, so it, there, our challenge now is with this huge portfolio of environmental water to demonstrate that we can efficiently and effectively use that to generate the outcomes that society are wanting and to be accountable for that. So we've made some big progress but there's uh, plenty of huge challenges ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bill, and I think there's no question that some of the market-based approaches they've developed in Australia to incentivize sound water resources management are exactly some of the nexus approaches that, that, that Pavel is trying to get at, so that's great. Julia. Okay. I don't press anything, right? Um, I'm not sure. No? Nope. Okay. Um, so if you listen to the speeches that Ban Ki-moon gives or that the president of the World Bank gives um, in, the in last month and next month, you'll hear the same development challenges being being stressed uh, over and over again. There's the energy security, food security, climate change, urbanization, uh, and environment, something around environmental protection. The biggest challenges of the 21st century for development are all requiring a better use and management of water, all of them. However, that's our strength, and it's also our, our challenge, right? Because if you're everywhere, you're nowhere. And I think that is where my sense of frustration comes from. Like every single day, there are choices being made around the world that lock in unsustainable patterns of consumption on a small scale and on a massive scale. And we, those choices done by urban, urbanists, or whatever you call them, urban development specialists and energy people, um, those, and, and people who build motorways and people who build dams, whatever, those things are being done Sometimes with consideration of today's water availability, almost never with consideration of tomorrow's water, water availability. And thereby lies the challenge, right? The choices are getting made, the, the, the patterns are getting locked in. Um, and I think that um, taking our, our sort of heads out of the sand and, and not allowing us to kind of wave our hands in the air and say, oh, but we'll have efficiency gains um, and other things that one, that one hears is for me the great upcoming challenge of water. Um, you can Google any world leader and water and you will find a nice statement. You will, We've, I've done it. You can find Nelson Mandela, Hillary Clinton, anybody. Hillary Clinton's are quite good, I have to say. But all the others, um, <laughs> <laughs> but not a coincidence. Um, but you can find it, I've, I've done it and you'll find them. And water is life, right? I mean, it's on the trucks of, of, of uh, DC, the DC uh, utility. But going from water is life to the types of tough choices that Bill just outlined, where you have to say, you can have some and you can't, and this is gonna cost you and this won't, that is the tough thing that nobody or few places are really willing to get at. And in the absence of confronting that problem on, a common, on common grounds, using common data, common information, um, it makes it easy to continue saying, it's okay, we'll release water out of agriculture because we'll have efficiency gains. And I don't, I'm sure you, many of you are, are scientists and are already convinced by that, but the literature on experience of a, achieving releases of water from agriculture through efficiency gains is not great around the world. And so the idea that we are currently living on our savings account, uh, we're consuming on a daily basis our savings account, which is the groundwater. Um, my equivalent of Pavel's presentation has a cushion that someone's sitting on, and the cushion's like nicely deflating, and that's the, um, that's the groundwater point. We are all living with our heads in the sand, or our leaders are living with their heads in the sand and not confronting the difficult choices. And that's partly because we don't really know how to communicate the difficult choices to them. Scientists write too much like science. Non-scientists write water is life. Um, and so the reason that I very much support the initiative that, that we are describing here is because it's an attempt to merge those two, those two differences. You can't just have water is life, we'll get efficiency gains, because then you make really bad choices. You can't have scientists who say, it depends, it depends, it depends, which is, I'm afraid, my frustration sometimes. Um, trying to bring those two communities together is really a great challenge. 
So, and I'm assuming everyone in the audience is a kind of technical scientist type person. I think we need good knowledge. And that knowledge means good data, it means good analysis, and it means good interpretation, right? And that's not got the right conclusions to come from that analysis. And those three steps are not straightforward and are not always given. So you need that. But then I think we also need good process. So just having good conclusions that come out of good analysis and good data is not enough either. And I think that the social scientists, if there are any in the room, helping us think about how to gain consensus from that, how to make players with vastly, diff vastly different interests and vastly different power relationships hook themselves into a process from which it's not obvious to them that they can gain is a really interesting challenge going forward. And I believe there are techniques from some aspects of the economics and trade literature. I think there are techniques from kind of communications um, that could be used. So I think stopping at the information is not enough. But I, I do think the, the, the research community has an awful lot to teach us to get us from what it is life, it's terribly important to development, blah, 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 and to this world where m separate sectors make massive decisions and lock us into unsustainable patterns of consumption to a world where we are jointly tackling a constrained environment and allocating it in a way that appears to be most safe and most equitable. Anyway, thank you very and much. And how do we do this in an increasingly complex investment climate where the IFES may no longer be the lender of first choice and where 30-year 30, 30 purchase power agreements may not give us the sustainable results that we want to see in some of these large-scale infrastructure projects. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm just trying um, to figure out what to do. How I am, that's a, how, is a different, different, <laughs> different question. Um, I'll turn it over to Chuck, and then we'll go, go out to the audience. Well, thank you, Aaron. And I, I feel somewhat out of, out of place. Uh, these are the, the true experts. You're the experts, the scientists, the people who have a lot of the solutions that we need to bring forward uh, through that process that Pavel talked about. How can we integrate the sectors that are separate now mm -hmm. that Julia very much was talking about so that they can become more holistic, that we can bring solutions that consider all those different disciplines together? And that's really what I want to touch on a few issues relative to that and the, the U.S. Water Partnership and, and why we're here today. Um, first, I, I agree that the challenges are daunting, but I also agree that they present opportunities to us. Uh, these are solvable problems, and we really need to work together in order to solve them. The current business models, they're not bringing things to scale, and that's really where we're, we're doing these things in stovepipes and on one-off basis, and that's, that presents a problem for investors and for implementers, not to mention the users of those systems, so that they become unsustainable, and those patterns of consumption <coughs> that Julia talked about uh, are perpetuated. So what, what is the solution and what we think and what was launched last year on World Water Day, so happy World Water Day. It was, it was a year ago tomorrow uh, that the U.S. Water Partnership was launched as a public-private partnership. And that that's, presents one of the solutions, I think. It's not the only solution, but certainly one of the business models, one of the solutions to bring stakeholders together so that we can bridge those gaps, uh, bring together different uh, sectors of our society so that they can, uh, so we can solve some of these issues. So uh, last year, uh, Secretary Clinton, former Secretary Clinton, launched the U.S. Water Partnership uh, to bring together the public and private sector here in the U.S. to promote and unite the best of U.S. expertise and resources to solve these global water challenges where the needs are the greatest. And certainly those are mostly in the developing world. So what are the ways that we can do that? And, and I don't consider myself an expert, but certainly we do a lot of convening. We bring people together so that they, the experts can solve those problems. And so we're very excited about the opportunity to work with IASA. Uh, we, GETF, uh, my, uh, my organization, the Global Environment Technology Foundation, had the good fortune of working with IASA on the global energy assessment. And in that process, we convened the U.S. stakeholders uh, in that global study. And so we're very keen on working with IASA in a similar role as the U.S. Water Partnership to bring together U.S. expertise. And that's really where the scientific commu community, AAAS, can play an important role. So we're excited about this. This is a, a good opportunity for us to, to in, a, in a good process, to solve, uh, solve some of these problems and to bring people together to, uh, to do that.
And uh, don't be alarmed, I don't have lots of words here. Uh, but I did want to make uh, two, two quick points in response. Uh, first of all, uh, in my role as chair of the UNESCO International Hydrological Program, U.S. National Committee, uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, that organization has been around since 1975. The U.S. had a big role actually in initiating it. And it's, uh, it is, uh, w within UNESCO, its function is to facilitate a kind of broker uh, capacity and institution building around the world for improved water resource management. Uh, they do a little bit of support for uh, research and assessment of, in the water sources, uh, water resource arena around the world. They're about to launch their next uh, science plan, phase eight. Uh, these are six or seven or eight year long science plans that guide the, the, the basic uh, activities of UNESCO and all the partners around the world that uh, work with UNESCO, which is most countries in the world. Um, and uh, the, the goals of that science plan, I won't go into them now in any detail, but they're very closely aligned with what we've seen presented here today in terms of water security, improved resource management in terms of recognizing ecosystem flows, not just human needs for with extracting water from systems, recognizing the challenges that climate change uh, plays uh, as well. Uh, you can Google UNESCO IHB, U.S. National Committee, if you want to find out more or, or make contact with me. The other quick point I wanted to make is one from my own agency, the USGS. And um, one of my assignments as Associate Director for Climate and Land Use Change is to lead our Landsat uh, mission. Landsat is an Earth-observing satellite uh, operated in partnership with NASA. We just launched our what will become the eighth satellite uh, February 11th. It's in the final checkout period. It'll become operational in May. And one of the unique things about this satellite is it has two thermal bands. Uh, the previous ones have had one. But uh, with two thermal bands, this allows us to uh, resource managers, scientists around the world, to make assessments of the temperature of the surface of the Earth, which includes or which allows uh, some fairly sophisticated assessment of evapotranspiration, which has been used widely in the western U.S. to calibrate, to calibrate irrigated agriculture uh, water applications. And so it's greatly enhanced our ability and other countries around the world's ability to improve the manage of that resource and not waste that very limited uh, resource. Um, just today, uh, uh, about two hours ago, we released a, uh, with, in, with NASA a press release on the first image from the new satellite. So that's out. Uh, uh, it's over the front range in Colorado, a, a water-scarce region of the world. So I encourage people to look for that. Uh, one thing I'll add that I'm very proud of is that in the very end of 2008, we made all Landsat data free to anywhere in the world. So 190 countries now access those data. They're moderate resolution, 30 meter pixel size, and are used uh, extensively. Before we uh, released the data for free, about 20,000 images per year were downloaded on average. Now over 3 million images per year are accessed uh, around the world. So that's uh, a, a very useful tool. It's something that I call data democracy. Uh, in terms of making it available widely and freely to everyone around the planet. Thank you. Hey, Matt, that's a great point. Uh, you know, one of the key challenges that we've always had is that we've relied on country-provided data, which has what well, you get, you get out what you put in, and we've often had a lot of questions with that. Um, I, I'm going to turn to responses, but please uh, step up to the mic if you're interested in, in a comment. And as I turn to the panel, something that none of you mentioned, but which has been plaguing me a lot recently, is the issue of sedimentation. Yeah. You talked a little bit about salinity and, and salinization, but, but uh, I, sometimes I think sedimentation is, is now an unheralded resource that we don't talk enough about lately and how that might play into some of these issues. But I'm curious either in reaction to some of what Matt's talked about, some of the objective sources of data that we might be able to rely upon in doing some of these assessments, and but anything, no comments, reactions? Maybe I'll go to that question. Oh, yeah. Hello, my name is Ken McNaughton. I'm a writer, and I'd like to ask Professor Cabot about potential choke points on a global scale. Um, it's my understanding that uh, a lot of our fresh water is supplied by rivers, and furthermore, that Tibet is the source of many uh, of the world's population's rivers for fresh water supply. So I'd just be curious to know whether or not you think that Tibet is a, ch a potential choke point in terms of global fresh water supply. I would like to uh, respond to it in a broader sense. It's uh, basically the Himalaya glaciers, which we talk about, Tibet Himalaya glacier. 
It's definitely the case. I mean, uh, it connects to uh, one of my uh, conclusions that Asia, Southeast Asia, Asian rivers will be the future real hotspot of the, of, of the problem. However, it's, uh, um, when you do an attribution, as we call it, to, of a potential problem to uh, anthropogenic type of uh, interventions, which means uh, building more of the dams downstream, etc., etc., climate, which is, of course, the issue of the glacier melting, all the feedbacks which we still do not understand very well, like the black carbon feedback on the glacier. I must say that uh, I would be hesitating at this point to declare the glacier melting as the main issue in the region. I think we should be careful not to um, overestimate, overplay, and excuse, uh, seeking excuses only in climate issue. I think it's, it's an important thing. It will certainly lead on the longer term scale, because melting, of course, leads first to the more discharge. So we talk about problem which is kind of postponed, probably beyond 2050, 2030. Uh, it's an important thing, but I mean, uh, my position is uh, climate is uh, one of the factors in finding solutions rather than the main. So that's my answer to that. Thank you. Julia? Uh, you know, w there's another issue that comes up. We've talked a little bit about some of the man-made infrastructure, but I also wonder about the use of natural infrastructure and in trying to address some of these challenges and how we bring that to bear mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in on, on many of our issues. Uh, another question back. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Rich Blaustein, freelance environmental journalist. Uh, thanks for this excellent event. My uh, question is about desalination, how you all figure that will uh, figure in the future, and its connection to um, uh, lower energy costs, perhaps with renewable energy, solar, wind, and how might that figure to make it more promising? I would turn, because I know there are some developments which are exciting in Australia, for example, I would turn maybe to my colleagues to give you some examples that there is already actually thinking which leads to such a lower, lower cost, lower energy input. Maybe Bill would like to give an example. Uh, certainly not an area of expertise of my own, but during the drought, one of our, if you like, knee-jerk political reactions, uh, it was at a time of uh, national elections, was to invest in a number of large desalination plants for all of our capital cities, and there are two now in Perth at the cost of, I think, total of maybe nine, ten billion dollars uh, to secure water supply for our major cities. And certainly, um, uh, it was interesting because there'd been a lot of work done on uh, recycling, water recycling, and there was a lot of uh, um, discomfort in the community about um, accepting potable recyc recycled water for potable supply. Uh, and on that basis, I think uh, government went ahead with investments in desalination. A number of those uh, plants have never been uh, put into operation. Uh, the rains returned. They were expensive to use for energy purposes. Um, on the other hand, Melbourne got to the point, I think, where it had um, about three months of water supply left for a city of um, three million people. Um, so it got, you know, it was getting, and you can't truck water into a, a city of that size. And, and uh, so it, 